Hi, and welcome back. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, today we're going to talk about Markov matrices, um, which will build a little bit on some of the stuff we understood last time from the Fibonacci sequence. Okay, so let's start with an example. It's always nice to start with some small example, just to see what's happening. So suppose that we want to understand rental cars in Seattle. <laughs> so rental cars in Seattle. Let's say rental cars in slash out of Seattle. Okay. So suppose we know, or suppose we have, a, we run a rental car company and there's some cars in Seattle or some cars elsewhere and people will rent cars in one location and potentially return them in another location, right? Or they might return them in the same location. So let's suppose at the start, 2% of all of our cars are in Seattle, right? IE 0.02 and 98% of our cars are outside of Seattle aka 0.98, that proportion of them. And let's suppose also that every month of the cars that we, of the cars that we have in Seattle, suppose 20% of those cars, people rent them and return, return them outside of Seattle. So every month, 20% of the Seattle cars leave, but also some of the outside cars come to Seattle and stay. So let's suppose that 5% of the outside cars come to Seattle. And we want to understand, well, what is going to, what is happening with the number of cars that we have in Seattle. Okay. So one thing that we could do is we could track, we could keep track of what's happening using some vector and we can keep track of how things change from month to month by some matrix if we're in this kind of situation. Okay, so let's let WK be the vector whose first coordinate is the proportion of cars in Seattle at time K and second coordinate is the proportion of cars outside of Seattle Uh, at time k. In other words, uh, w naught, the state we start with is 0 0.02 times 0 0.98, and w1 will be what happens at after one month, w2 will be what happens after two months, etc. Okay, well, what does happen after one month? Okay, well, after one month, we have in, so after one month, so in Seattle, how many cars, what proportion of cars do we have in Seattle? Where, well, we started with 0 0.02 of the cars total and 20% of them left. That means we still have 80% of them. Also, we gained 5% of the outside cars, right? So we had 0.98 times 5% of those. That's the fraction of cars that are in Seattle after one month. What about outside of Seattle? Well, outside of Seattle will be 20% of the cars that previously were in Seattle and will be 95% of the cars that were previously outside of Seattle. They'll still stay outside of Seattle. In other words, what is W1? W1 is 0.02 times 0.8 plus 0.98 times 0.05, comma, 0 0.02 times 0 0.20 plus 0.98 times 0.95. Okay, in fact, uh, I guess I, I should do it on, on this frame. It's not so hard to see that what this is, is it's 0.8 comma 0.2, 0 0.05 comma 0.95 times W1. Right, why? Because if you do this product, if you do this this product, the first coordinate will be uh, this row dotted with this column. So it's 0.8 of the cars that are in Seattle plus 0.05 of the cars that are outside of Seattle. And the second coordinate will, will like, likewise be the second row dotted with that column vector. In other words, moving from state to state, this is the matrix that governs our behavior. <laughs> 
Okay, so in general, in this example, if we let A be this matrix, 0 0.8, 0 0.2, 0 0.05, 0 0.95, then um, if you multiply this A times WK, you'll get WK plus 1. Because that's exactly what this matrix is doing. It's taking 0.8 of the proportion in Seattle plus 0 0.05 of the proportion outside of Seattle. That's the, that's the proportion that will end up in Seattle after another month. And it's doing the same thing in the second row. Which means that in order to understand the long-term behavior of these vectors WK, we just need to understand the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix A. Right, and of course, by the way, I, I didn't say this, but also this means that WK is A to the K times W naught. Right, every month what you do is you just multiply by A again. Well, this you could actually do. You can do this by hand, and also at the end of this lecture, I'll discuss some software options. Now that we're past the first week, uh, you can use software for computations like this because that'll allow us to do bigger examples much more easily. At some point, you don't want to compute this stuff by hand. You should still be able to, but we don't, we don't want to do it. So uh, in this case, what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Okay, it's a two by two matrix. Its first eigenvalue is one with eigenvector 0 0.2, 0 0.8. And its second eigenvalue is 0 0.75 with eigenvector negative one, one. Okay, so like I said, at the end of this, we'll talk about some software that will do this very quickly. Okay, now what did we need to do in the previous lecture? What you need to do is you need to solve u times c equals w naught for c. You need to solve for this. Well, I can do that. I'll tell you exactly <laughs> what it is. Uh, w naught is equal to 1 times the first eigenvector plus 0 0.18 times the second eigenvector. In other words, this vector c that we talked about last time is 1 comma 0 0.18. That's what that says. And then what we saw last time is that we can write the kth state vector as a linear combination of these eigenvectors using powers of the eigenvalues times these constants in C. That's exactly what we saw. What you do is you take C1, you take the first eigenvector to the kth power, sorry, the first eigenvalue to the kth power, you multiply that times the eigenvector, plus C2 times the second eigenvector to the kth power times the second, sorry, the second eigenvalue to the kth power times the second eigenvector, All right? So this, let me just write this down. This one is C1, this one is lambda 1, this one is U1, lambda 1 to the K, really. This one is C2, this one is lambda 2 to the K, this one is U2. And drawing on our experience from last time, as k tends to infinity, this part will go to 0. It has an eigenvalue that's smaller than 1 in absolute value. And so as you iterate k, as, you, as k gets bigger and bigger, the 0.75 to the k gets smaller and smaller, and it tends to 0. So this tends to 0 as k tends to infinity. Tends to 0 as k tends to infinity. And so uh, in the long term, what do you get? the limit as k goes to infinity of wk is equal to 0 0.2 times 0 0.8. You just take the limit as k tends to infinity. Meaning that in the long run, 20% of cars will be in Seattle, 80% of cars will be outside of Seattle. The next month, of course, they reshuffle again, but still 20% of the cars will be in Seattle, 80% will be outside of Seattle. Just like last time, the long-term behavior is governed by the largest eigenvalue and the largest eigenvector. We're sort of converging to the, to the eigenvector associated to the largest eigenvalue of A. Okay, and this is the example to keep in mind as we discuss the more general things during the remainder of this lecture. This very concrete example 
of where th we got a natural matrix that governed the behavior of some states that we're tracking. Okay, so let me make some definitions here. So let's let A, whose entries I'll call A, I, J, let's let this be an N by N matrix, a square matrix. I'm gonna call A positive, which I'll denote A greater than zero if every entry is positive. Okay, so I'm defining the symbol A greater than zero. Before this moment, it made no sense to talk about a matrix as greater than zero because a matrix is a matrix, but zero is a number. What I'm saying is I'll call a matrix positive if every single entry in that matrix is positive, and I'll use this notation. Okay, also important, I'll call A non-negative, denoted A greater than or equal to zero, if each of the entries is greater than or equal to zero. These will be important in a minute. Uh, I'll call A Markov, which you also might call stochastic in some other classes, or maybe column stochastic. Uh, if A is non-negative, so it has no negative entries, and each column of A sums to one. Another way of saying this is that if you sum the jth column, you get one for every j. So a Markov matrix is a non-negative matrix, all of whose columns sum to exactly one. And I'll call it positive Markov if it's Markov and it's positive. Okay, note that this matrix that we were just looking at, this matrix A, is positive. All of its entries are positive. And it's also Markov because each of its columns sum to one. So this matrix A, this is a positive Markov matrix. Okay, our example from the Fibonacci sequence the other day was this. The notes call it A again, but I find that distasteful. <laughs> if you have different matrices, you should give them different names. This matrix is non-negative. All of its entries are non-negative, but it's not Markov because the first column sums to two. So this is a non-negative and not, not Markov. Okay, and very naturally, these kinds of Markov matrices um, will arise in studying certain kinds of systems, like this system of rental cars, right? The system of rental cars that we set up, very plausible setup. This Markov matrix appeared. Okay, so let's first think just in general about Markov matrices. Okay, so some notation. If I write the vector one, if I put a hat on my one or if I bold it in the notes, this vector is the all ones vector. Okay, in the notes it's written as one, one, one transpose because if you want to save room in line, you don't want these tall column vectors, so you just write the transpose. And a useful thing to, to say is that uh, to say that A is Markov means exactly that if you take the transpose of this vector and multiply it by the matrix, you get uh, the transpose. That's right, right? Yes. Right, why is this? Just just think about it. Uh, just think about it with a, even a two by two example, actually. A11, A12, A21, A22. If you take this product, this is one transpose times A, what do you get? You get exactly uh, a11 plus a21, comma, uh, I should have done this a little further to the left, uh, comma, a12 plus a21. 
So if you multiply by one transpose, what you're doing is you're returning the sums of all the columns. And so you want all the columns to sum to one. In other words, you want one transpose A to be one transpose. OK, so this is just a neat way to say that A is Markov. And let's now prove a little, a little lemma. How much room do I need? It's always safer to start a new page. OK, so lemma. Let's even start it here. <laughs> lemma. So suppose that A is positive Markov. Then also, uh, for any natural number k, uh, a to the k is also positive Markov. So if you take powers of a positive Markov matrix, you always get a positive Markov matrix. OK, so here's the proof. OK, so let's suppose that a is positive Markov. And let's let V be any non-negative vector, non-zero. Okay, so by a non-negative vector, I mean all of its entries are non-negative. Okay, now let's observe some facts. One, uh, if I take A times the vector V, I'm going to get actually a positive vector. Why is this? Uh, each uh, so since each entry of a v right that's a, a vector in R n uh, is given by the dot product of a row of a and v. So a is a bunch of positive numbers. V is a bunch of non-negative numbers. If you take their dot product, you're always going to get a positive number, right? Because V will have some at least one positive component. And you're multiplying that by a positive number. Everything that you add together will be non-negative, and there's going to be at least one positive term. OK, so if you multiply uh, a positive Markov matrix by a non-negative vector, you get a positive vector. OK, now. Uh, if, I mean, if one transpose V equals one, uh, right? What does this mean? This is just shorthand for saying that the vector sums to one, right? Let, let, let me, let me just show you, right? Suppose it's this, what is this? This is just V one plus V two plus V three. So if you happen to have a vector that sums to one, then one transpose times a times v equals one transpose times v, right? Because this is equal to one transpose since a is Markov. And this is going to equal one. Assuming that um, v sums to one, the, the entries in v sum to one. But what do we just see? We saw that this equals 1, which means that uh, the entries in AV sum to 1. So if V sums to 1, then so does AV. Now, how does this tell us about the powers of A? Well, what is A squared? a squared is a times a, right? But let's write a as its column vectors like this. Right, this is just a again. Now, a matrix times another matrix, the result will be uh, a times a1, a times a2, a times a n. The jth column. You can just think of this as doing a bunch of, it's like you're doing each column individually, right? It's like you multiply the matrix by the first column that gives you the first column of the result. 
Now, A is positive Markov. That means that each of these vectors are positive and sum to 1. But what did we say? We said that if you have a non-negative vector that sums to 1, then also uh, when you multiply it by A, it also sums to 1. So each of these vectors uh, is sums to 1 as well. I mean, each sums to 1. That's by, by 2. Sorry, let, let me do this in order. By part 1, each of these vectors is actually positive because it's a positive Markov matrix times a non-negative, non-zero vector. So each of these by 1 is positive, and by 2 sums to 1. So this matrix A squared has all positive entries. In other words, A squared is positive, and each of its columns sums to 1. In other words, it's Markov. Right. So. A squared is positive Markov. OK, but we just showed that, uh, essentially we showed that A times a positive Markov matrix is positive Markov, which means that A cubed is also positive Markov, right? So actually, we showed that A times any positive Markov matrix is positive Markov. So a cubed, which is a times a squared, is also positive Markov. And you just continue this process. Right, so continuing, a to the k is positive Markov. So if you start with a positive Markov matrix, you take powers, then you will always get the result to be a positive Markov matrix. OK, now we have two very powerful theorems, two really amazing theorems um, about these things. Actually, it's <laughs> actually it's a theorem about positive matrices. And then you can conclude even more if it happens to be Markov. So let's state these theorems. Uh, the proof, as the notes say, it's beyond the scope of this class. That's really more math than application. But this thing is called Perron's theorem. You should know the name for positive matrices. Okay, so if A is a positive matrix, I should say if A is a square positive matrix. So if A is an n by n matrix and A is positive, then A has what we call a dominant eigenvalue. Let's call the dominant eigenvalue lambda, lambda A satisfying the following properties. In other words, this is what I mean by dominant eigenvalue. OK, so first of all, uh, the dominant eigenvalue is positive. An eigenvalue is just a real number, right? So it's, it's a positive eigenvalue. And it has an eigenvector. Okay, every eigenvalue, of course, has an eigenvector. But it's special. I'll call it UA, which is also positive called the dominant eigenvector. OK, so the dominant eigenvalue has a positive eigenvector. None of the entries are 0. None of the entries are negative. OK, 2, the algebraic multiplicity of this positive eigenvector is always 1. So it's like a unique dominant Sorry, this dominant eigenvalue. It's like a unique dominant eigenvalue. It doesn't occur more than once. Why is it sort of called dominant? Uh, because if mu is any eigenvalue, any other eigenvalue of A, then the absolute value of mu will be less than lambda A. So in other words, there's like a biggest eigenvalue. If lambda a were like 2, say, it's it's not going to be in a second, but if lambda a were 2, then that would mean that all the other eigenvalues are between negative 2 and 2, but strictly within there. So you can't even have negative 2, right? So the picture here is that uh, 
if you look at lambda a and negative lambda a, zero here is in the middle, then all of the other eigenvalues, uh, they can't even be as big, but they all lie inside here. So it's called the dominant one because it's sort of the unique biggest one. Okay, and fourth, uh, if u mu is a non-dominant eigenvector, so if mu is any other, sorry, non-dominant eigenvalue, if mu is any other eigenvalue, then no eigenvector of mu uh, with eigenvalue mu is non-negative. Okay, so what this is saying is that positive matrices are really special. It, it will have a unique biggest eigenvalue, and that eigenvalue will have a positive eigenvector. And actually, none of the other eigenvalues can have a even a non-negative eigenvector. So this is beyond the scope of the class. It's an extremely powerful theorem, though. There is a reference uh, in the notes to a book where you can prove it. We have an even better theorem, so I, I want to leave this on this page. So this is Perron's theorem for positive Markov matrices. So if A is positive Markov, sorry, positive Markov. So the first theorem was just about any positive matrix, but if it also happens to be Markov, then also we have five the dominant eigenvalue is always equal to one, which means that all other eigenvalues are between negative one and one strictly, right? So for any other eigenvalue in absolute value, it's less than one. And maybe the most amazing theorem is if W naught is a non-negative vector, uh, then the limit as k goes to infinity of a to the k w naught is equal to c times ua, where c is bigger than equal to zero. Okay, so I just wrote a lot of stuff down. What do I mean? If you start with a non-negative vector, and you keep on multiplying it by a, it will tend to the dominant eigenvector or some scalar multiple of the dominant eigenvector. Okay, so you have a unique largest eigenvalue. Its eigenvector, it has a positive eigenvector. And if you start with any other non-negative vector and you keep on multiplying by a, it will tend to that positive eigenvector. Okay, so this is a, a really, it's an amazing theorem. It says that positive Markov matrices have some incredibly strong properties. Okay, and we already had, at the beginning of class, we had an example where the matrix was positive Markov, which means that all of the parts of this theorem must be true. But we actually computed this, right? Or we didn't actually, I told you what the answer was, but <laughs> notice that it has a unique largest eigenvalue, and it's supposed to be one, which it is, right? All the other eigenvalues in absolute value are less than one. Also, that eigenvector is a positive eigenvector, right? This eigenvector here associated to the dominant eigenvalue, this dominant eigenvector is positive. Also for all the other eigenvalues, they don't have a positive eigenvector. This one does not have any positive eigenvectors because one of the coordinates will be negative and one of the coordinates will be positive. And if we started with, uh, I guess I, I didn't write down what W naught is on this page. W naught was what, 0 0.02, 0 0.98. If you start with a non-negative vector and you keep on multiplying by A, it will tend to uh, a multiple of the dominant eigenvector, which is exactly what happened. So all of the phenomena that we just talked about in Perron's theorem for positive Markov matrices uh, appear in this example as they should. You have a largest eigenvector with a, so you have a largest eigenvalue, a dominant eigenvalue with a 
positive eigenvector. None of the other eigenvectors are positive. And you start with any, any non-negative vector, and you keep on multiplying by a, it will tend to a multiple of that dominant eigenvector. OK. Um, this, by the way, is highly non-obvious. So um, I say highly. Let's say somewhat non-obvious. Yeah, let's say somewhat non-obvious. Um, because if you think about the setup here, if I changed the proportion, if I said, OK, instead of starting with 2% of the cars in Seattle, let's start with 80% of the cars in Seattle, and let's start with 20% of the cars out of Seattle, then there's a lot more cars in Seattle than out of Seattle. Right? So you might think that maybe in the long term, something different will happen. This is a totally different state. But Perron's theorem says, no, no matter which state you, you start with, it's going to tend to a multiple of the dominant eigenvector. In other words, the proportion of cars inside of Seattle, inside of Seattle or outside of Seattle doesn't depend on what proportion you start with in the long, in the long run. OK. Should I prove what's proved in the text or in the notes? Yeah, let's prove it. Okay, so what's proved? If it's too long, I'll just I'll just cut it in in the edit. So if you're seeing this, it wasn't too long. Uh, in the notes, uh, what we what they do is they prove just this second part of the theorem, assuming the first part of the theorem. Okay, so let's let's prove part two from part one. Okay, so what additional things do I need to show? I, I, I get to assume that it has a dominant eigenvalue with a positive dominant eigenvector of multiplicity one. And I need to show that actually, if it's a positive Markov matrix, that that dominant eigenvalue is actually one. Okay, so suppose that A is positive Markov. Let's actually call this five, because here I called it five. In the, in the notes, it's called one in the next section. So suppose A is a positive Markov matrix. Now, uh, the columns of A sum to one, right? That's what it means to be Markov, which means that the rows of A transpose sum to one And it's not so hard to see that what this means is that a transpose times the times the all ones vector is equal to the all ones vector, because uh, what you're doing when you multiply by one is you're just getting the sums of all of the rows. Well, what does this mean? This means that we've found an eigenvector of a transpose, and it's the all ones vector. So one is an eigenvector of a transpose with eigenvalue one. Now, A was a positive matrix. That means that A transpose is a positive matrix. Okay, so since A is positive, this means that A transpose is positive. So since I'm assuming the first part of the theorem, which was just for any positive matrix, that means that it can only have one eigenvalue that has a positive eigenvector. Every non-dominant eigenvalue has no, no positive eigenvector, which must mean that since I found a positive eigenvector, that one is actually my dominant eigenvalue. All right, so since A transpose is positive by part one, uh, this means that uh, one is the dominant eigenvalue of A transpose. But you saw on the problem sets that the eigenvalues of A are the same thing as the eigenvalues of A transpose. So if 1 is the biggest eigenvalue of A transpose, it means that 1 is also the largest eigenvalue of A in absolute value. So since A and A transpose have the same eigenvalues, 
This implies that uh, the dominant eigenvalue of A is 1. Okay, now for the second statement, I need to prove that if you take any non-negative vector and you multiply by A a bunch of times, it will tend to the dominant eigenvector. Okay, by the, by the way, I should mention that I haven't said anything about A's dominant eigenvector. A transpose has a dominant eigenvector that's all ones. And so its do dominant eigenvalue is one. A has a dominant eigenvalue of one, but I haven't said anything about its dominant eigenvector. Its dominant eigenvector will not in general be the all ones vector. Okay, so maybe that's worth saying. Note, we are not saying anything about the dominant eigenvector for A, which is called UA. All, all we said anything about was that one was the dominant eigenvector for A transpose. Okay. So to prove six, in other words, to prove that uh, any, you start with any non-negative vector, you multiply by A, you tend to the dominant eigenvector. Let's assume for simplicity that A is diagonalizable. Okay, it turns out that we only will need to know it in this case anyway. So this is a little bit of a cheat, but not that much of a cheat. Okay, and the reason why I want to assume this is because in the setup, uh, we know that wk is equal to c1 times lambda 1 to the k times u1 plus up through cn lambda n to the k times un. We, we, we showed this last time. But now we know something about each of these eigenvectors, sorry, each of these eigenvalues. The first one, I might as well assume, is my largest eigenvalue, which is 1. So this is really c1 times 1 to the k times uh, mu ua, the dominant eigenvector, plus c2 lambda 2 to the k times u2 plus cn lambda n to the k times un. But, uh, but we know that each of these in absolute value is strictly less than 1 if i is bigger than or equal to 2. So as k tends to infinity, all those terms go to 0. So all these terms tend to 0 as k tends to infinity, which means that as k tends to infinity, Oops. of wk, you just pick up c1 ua. Okay, but uh, I said a little bit more than that in this part of the theorem. I also said that the, the, um, the value c is actually non-negative. It's actually positive. Uh, it's not heading to zero. Uh, why is that? So y is c1 positive well we know that any multiple or any power of a positive markov matrix is positive markov right so y is c1 greater than zero so we know that a to the k is positive markov so that means that if you take its transpose and multiply by the ones vector you get the ones vector that just that's what it means to be markov and since w naught was a non-zero vector, sorry, a non-negative non-zero vector, therefore, if you take this thing, remember, this is the thing that I'm interested in. I'm interested in uh, this vector as k gets bigger. Well, th the rules of transposes say that if you have the transpose of a product, you take the product of the transposes in the opposite order. But now this thing is just one. So this is w not transpose times one. And remember, w not is non-negative. The ones vector is all positive. So you're just adding a bunch of non-negative numbers together. So this thing is positive. So, 
So if you take the limit as k goes to infinity of this thing, uh, this is right. This thing tends to c one uh, u a transpose times one. This is positive, which exactly says that the entries of this vector uh, sum to a positive number. Therefore, I must be taking a positive multiple of the dominant eigenvector. So sum of entries in C1 UA is positive. So this implies that C1 is, a, is actually a positive, a positive number. OK. Now, there's a very apt warning in the, the notes, which is that this theorem, you need to remember that it's for positive matrices. If you're not positive, if you're only non-negative, then this theorem can fail. But, uh, okay, so warning. There's actually, uh, I don't know how common this is. Uh, in some math textbooks, you'll see like, uh, a triangular sign with like an S, which is supposed to be like a curvy road ahead. <laughs> like if you're driving on a mountain or something. So here's the warning. Uh, if A is non-negative, then the Perron's theorem can fail. In other words, if there's any non, if there's any entries that are actually zero in your matrix, then you're not guaranteed to have a unique largest eigenvalue with a dominant eigenvector. But we do have the following nice situation, which even if you have a non-negative matrix that might have some zero entries, could still help. Uh, if A is non-negative, so not necessarily positive, uh, but A to the K is positive for some K, uh, then one is still, uh, sorry, I should say, and Markov. So AK is positive Markov. Markov is important, otherwise what I'm saying is not true. One is still the largest eigen, the unique dominant eigenvalue in the sense that uh, every eigenvalue is less than one other than the, the dominant one. Sorry, something is rattling. I wonder if it's this can of water. OK, so there's a proof in the text. It's not so, not so hard to see, so let me just move on. So here's a situation. OK, so the point is, is that sometimes we will have a Markov matrix that's not necessarily positive with some zero entries. And we'll, it will be very useful to know the result of the theorem. You'll see, you'll see why soon. But we don't need it to be positive Markov. We just need some power to be positive Markov. OK, so um, right. Let me, let me give you the example, because the example is useful. Actually, let me switch to, um, let me switch computers. OK, so I've switched computers here. So now you can see uh, what I'm seeing. Suppose we have three groups with populations P1, P2, P3. And after each week, each group splits in half and joins the others. Okay, so you have three groups. And at each time step, you take the first group, you split it in half, and you put each half into one of the other two groups. You do the same thing with the second group. You split in half, put one in group one, I mean, half in group one, half in group three. It takes group three, you split in half, you place them in group one and group two. Okay, so it turns out that you can model what's happening by this matrix, right? Because in the first coordinate, you'll get exactly one half P2 plus one half P3, which is exactly the amount that you have in the first group after you multiply, uh, after one week. So this thing is a Markov matrix, but it's not positive. It's only non-negative. But if you square it, it is positive. Okay, so that means that you could apply, uh, I mean, that means that this matrix, even though it's not that doesn't satisfy the hypotheses of Perron's theorem, still does have one as its unique dominant 
eigenvalue. And we could even compute this numerically, okay? So uh, this is where I said that we would talk about some software. So this software that we're gonna use, okay, you could use any software, but if you don't feel comfortable using any software, then I would recommend that you use Julia for several reasons. First of all, Julia is quick, Julia is free, and also Julia is what's used in the notes, okay? so. So you can go to julialang.org and you could download the Julia programming language. You can download it as, as an installer. And once you've done that, you can open Julia and you'll get this, this screen. Okay, so the documentation online for Julia is very good. If you want to know how to do something with Julia, you can just Google Julia eigenvalues or whatever. So first thing we'll do is we'll say using linear algebra. So now we know that Julia loads in some linear algebra package. And now let me take this matrix uh, in the notes. So it's 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 fourth. That's the first row, 1 fourth, 1 half, 1 fourth. That's the second row, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 half. That's the third row. OK, so uh, as I claimed, now Julia knows that this matrix A is a 3 by 3 matrix with these entries. And one thing you can do is you can find the eigenvalues of A. Okay, and since this is this thing is a positive uh, Markov matrix, um, it means that we should expect to have one being the dominant eigenvalue. And that's kind of exactly what happens. <laughs> What's happening here? It looks like I have. 2.499999999 as one eigenvalue, 0.25 as one eigenvalue, and 0.9999999998 as one eigenvalue. Okay, but this is just some issue with float precision, I guess, right? These are these are 64 float 64s. Uh, one important thing to learn <laughs> is how to use a computer, right? So I would not like because I know this theorem, I know that actually this eigenvalue is one, but this is just some computational rounding error. Okay, so really the largest eigenvalue here is one. It dominates the other two, which I presume are both one fourth actually. And I can even find the eigenvectors of A, and I assume it'll give me to me in the same order. Uh, yes. So this first one is an eigenvector for the first eigenvalue. The second column is it eigenvector for the second eigenvalue, and this third one is an eigenvector for the third eigenvalue. And this vector, if you take a scalar multiple, will become a positive vector. Right? So just ignore all the negatives. It's also still an eigenvector with that eigenvalue. So we have a positive eigenvector for the eigenvalue 1. OK, uh, which means that it's just, uh, you, can, you can say that the dominant eigenvector here is 1, 1, 1. Or if you prefer to scale it, it's one third, one third, one third. Uh, so now let me go back. Okay, so as the notes say, if you start with w naught equals eight sixteen thirty two, then you iterate over time. Uh, so as k tends to infinity, uh, w k will tend to some multiple of one third, one third, one third. We even know which multiple because we started out with 56 people. And so in the end, you'll have a third of them in group one, a third of them in group two, and a third of them in group three. Okay, but in the last couple of minutes, um, let me discuss just a couple of theorems that apply to non-negative Markov matrices, which will be very important. Okay, so there's an example that shows that Perron's theorem fails for non-negative matrices. It only holds for positive matrices. But non-negative Markov matrices do have nice properties. So here's, I'm not gonna prove this theorem. This is called the Frobenius theorem or Frobenius' theorem. Okay, so if A is non-negative, then A has a dominant eigenvalue lambda, lambda A such that one lambda a is non-negative with an eigenvector that's also non-negative 
And two, uh, if mu is another eigenvector, sorry, another eigenvalue, then mu is less than or equal to lambda a. Okay, so you should think of this as a weakening of Perron's theorem. Perron's theorem holds for positive matrices. Frobenius's theorem holds for non-negative matrices. So what power do we lose here? So first of all, uh, in Perron's theorem, the dominant eigenvalue was positive and had a positive eigenvector. If you have a non-negative matrix, then you only know that the dominant eigenvalue is non-negative and the eigenvector is non-negative. Okay, also in Perron's theorem, it, uh, the algebraic multiplicity of the dominant eigenvalue was one. In other words, there was like a unique dominant eigenvector, right? There's only a one dimensional space of dominant eigenvectors. Here, I'm saying nothing about the multiplicity. So you might not get a unique dominant eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue might happen multiple times, which is sort of exactly what two is saying, right? Every other eigenvalue is less than or equal to this dominant eigenvalue. So there is some largest eigenvalue that's non-negative. It has a non-negative eigenvector. All the other eigenvalues are less than or equal to it. So it's not as dominant as before. But this is sometimes all, all you want anyway. And the follow-up theorem to this is if A is non-negative and Markov, then lambda A is actually equal to 1. Again, we're not saying anything about the algebraic multiplicity. So now it could occur more than once. But what it does say is that all the eigenvalues are less than or equal to 1 in absolute value. right? Which means that you could have an eigenvalue of like negative 1, for example. Right. So you might have, or you could have two eigenvalue, the eigenvalue one might occur with multiplicity two. But sometimes this is all you need. And so you should think of the Frobenius theorem as just a, a weakening of Perron's theorem. So you could call this the Perron Frobenius theorem and put them together. But one is for positive matrices, one is for non negative matrices. It's just a little bit weaker. Okay. Next time we'll talk about, we'll bring this all to an application. We're going to talk about Google PageRank and how to think about Google PageRank as a Perron-Frobenius eigenvector of a certain matrix. All right, see you next time.